Hello, listeners. Welcome back to Fighting the Envelope, where we fight the envelope and push the current. So let's start off and say today we're going to be talking about one of the most iconic female singers of the prior decade. And sorry to break it to everyone, but we're not talking about Iggy Azalea, but instead we're talking about the lovely T Swift. Now, I think it is important that two young 20 something straight cis males who are in no way, shape, or form associated with anything directly related to Visco or TikTok talk about Taylor's importance over the prior decade in both music and culture. You know, I'd view my girl Tay Tay, who I am a pretty avid fan of, I would see her as a modern day Rolling Stone. You know, just because of the way she really reinvents herself. And I know what people are are, are thinking, especially some of our our older listeners by our demographic. We have a few older listeners. You're going, how can you compare Taylor Swift to the Rolling Stones? And you see, Taylor Swift has really tackled a lot of different genres. And not only has she gone for it, but she's really made a name for her in country and pop. And even now, she's going into a more acoustic, folkish sound. And she hit it out of the park. I think that, honestly, Taylor Swift will be closely associated with pop. And because of this, she's probably stayed the most relevant out of the other top pop artists of the prior decade. Considering, like, Adele, Lady Gaga, Carly Rae Jepsen, and even Katy Perry all got swept under the rug and Taylor Swift remained in the spotlight. I would even say, in my whole honest opinion, that Taylor Swift has been more relevant and in the spotlight longer than even Beyonce has. Ooh, hot take. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of tackle this as, as we go through the discography, just, or at least I'll, I'll, I will. She's done a lot for not just women, but music as a whole. Her, 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 her stances on, on big topics such as uh, the Me Too movement or the Apple Music, uh, she, she shows that she does it not for her own personal greed, but for the people, you know, for the little Visco girls listening to her. So there's two things I want to note with what Cameron just said, and in case our viewers understand. So he says, hit it out of the ballpark. That's a baseball reference. (laughs) Uh, Basically, he's implying that it was a home run. And tackle is a reference to football, where well, or rugby. I think you can tackle in rugby, and you can somewhat tackle in soccer. But basically, it just means <laughs> take someone to the ground. But really, what he's trying to say is that like she tackles, like she kills whatever she's killing, and album or music or even stance wise. Yeah, you know, Brandon and I, we we had a talk, and we were thinking, we've been talking about a lot of a. Uh, guy stuff you know we've been we've been going over about like and and even if you look back at our lists a lot of our picks were old man picks you know we were we were really just not addressing our audience of girls modern day girls that listen to you know the pop we need to tackle the pop scene and i feel like it's only fitting that we talk about the most the biggest pop star of our of our generation so far I agree. But we also drew a fine line, and we, we talked about it a little bit, and we were originally going to do this bit where we talked about all the males that she dated, but she's dated a lot of males, she's dated them for a very short amount of time, and there's a lot of songs about them, and you know what? We just start sounding like 12-year-old girls gossiping when we talk about them. Exactly. Even though we're trying to um, you know, broaden our audience, we're trying to get a, you know more people to listen to us, we're trying to tackle more music. We don't want to come off as 12-year-old little girl. <laughs> yeah, there, we can only be so excited about a relationship between Taylor Swift and Harry Styles. <laughs> we can only be so excited. Exactly. But you know what we can be excited about? Tell All me. of her albums. We, we, Cameron and I, we're different than most people our age. We're, we're different. We, we actually sit down and we dissect art. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, Taylor Swift is no different. And you, people might think, okay, well, you're, you're crazy because... Taylor's not someone that you can just sit down and listen to her albums. Um, false. You can. <laughs> this this might be a, a, this this might be pretty surprising to uh, some of those that think they really know Brandon and I. But we are actually pretty big 
modern day pop fans. I know Brandon is a pretty big Katy Perry fan. Uh, I'm I'm a, I'm an avid Katy Perry fan as well. But we both really, really like Taylor Swift a lot, too. So we might surprise you with this episode on our knowledge of uh, Tay-Tay. But every journey has its beginning. You know, every every Lord of the Rings story has to start in, in the village of hobbits. <laughs> and you know what? That's exactly what we're about to do. We're about to tackle her first album. Again, tackle, take down, kill uh, her first album, uh, which is a self-titled album called Taylor Swift. And it was created in 2006 now to me this is her most generic sounding album and while it's not bad per se it just lacks the charm that a lot of her other albums have you know unlike her other work her hits are the only thing that drives this album to be listenable and even some of the hits such as tim mcgraw are just kind of weak kind of cringy to hear uh teardrops on my guitar picture to burn should have said no in our song though they do bop they are true classics but if she would have continued on this route this straight nashville country route then she's just someone like miranda lambert or cheryl crow where yeah she's still relevant but she's not as relevant as she could be you see while i i I do agree with some of your arguments i think that the filler songs on this album are a little bit weaker i think that for a debut of how old was she she was like 16 was she or 17 she 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 was pretty young for someone that was so young, just coming into the giant monster that the music industry is, she really, um, again, it, it might sound generic, but she really kind of went for what was, you know, what would get her attention. And you can kind of respect that to some degree. While she wasn't really fighting the envelope, she was kind of trying to Push the current. Push the current. <laughs> no, I was going to say plant her roots. Try to get a, a name going for herself before she really um, started to, uh, you know, stir the pot. And uh, I think that this song's hits are a little bit stronger than her other country hits, in my opinion. I think Teardrops on My Guitar and Our Song are two of my favorite country songs that she made. And I just remember when I was when I was a kid... These songs were just played all the time. I don't know if it was just the people I was with, but I know that uh, that uh, they were blasting. You know, I think Cameron phrased that wrong because he is <laughs> Irish. When he was a wee little lad, when I was a wee lad. <laughs> when I was a wee little lad. See, I... many people don't know this, but uh, a lot of my family comes from Ripley, Ohio. So I was out there in the the country, and you know those little country girls. I have a lot of country cousin girls, girl cousin from the country uh, could, you, could you say it more <laughs> awkward or <laughs> who just loved taylor swift so you know i got i got a a lot of early taylor swift in my my final vote out of 10 six out of 10 that's what this album is for me i wouldn't go too much higher um i would probably give it about a six out of 10 but i wouldn't give it like um I, I wouldn't say it's because I think it's a bad album. I think that it's just a stepping stone. Um, while I would agree with you on this one, I don't agree with your later ones. Um, I think, yeah, I think we differ yeah, on the next say. album too, which yeah. is Fearless, which came out in 2008. This is where our girl t <laughs> stay coming out alive and where she begins to form her true self. It still has that Nashville country flair but this she starts to incorporate some rock and pop into it and and uh i think it's while the album itself isn't like well known or memorable i think it's still a very boppable album to listen to and i think you have it's one where you can bop to songs like you belong with me and love story which were anywhere and everywhere at that time but you can also bop to some of the fillers such as hey steven white horse and 15 uh i think I don't know. It is a great album. Uh, I'm actually going to give it a surprising 8 out of 10, and I think it's the best of her country rock albums. See, this is where we disagree. I think that though there are some really good songs on here, such as You Belong With Me, I think that her first album has, it can, can rely on the excuse of being a first album, of being you know a rookie album. I think that this album kind of falls into the, the similar... Um, mistakes that that taylor swift 2006 made 
she it, it kind of sounds a little generic it doesn't sound as generic but i think that this being her sophomore album it makes it a little bit harder to make it as an excuse of her being like a, a rookie writer even though she was only 18 19 when this album came out i think that she should have started to to stir it a little bit more and i would not give this as strong of a rating i'd give it probably a six out of ten again but if i had to go into like decimals i would have gave the first one like a 6.5 and this one like a 6.3 if that makes any sense yeah but what, why get decimals just <laughs> queer i'm just queer. trying to say like even though they're both six out of tens i would still put taylor swift a little higher than fearless yes yeah. but there is an album that came out around this time that was actually made by another artist who might have had a beef with her throughout a good portion of the 2010s and that's <laughs> katie perry and while uh, it, it's not her most famous album. Katy Perry's One of the Boys also came out this year, and it, it, it shows that these two were going to be fighting for the top spot um, from this point on. Uh, I, if I personally had to pick, I would say that One of the Boys is slightly better. Uh, it's not too far off, but um, you can understand where a rivalry might, might be formed. I, I think they were actually pretty good friends at the time. I don't. I, I think that it was a little bit later when they, they actually like became like, friends but i don't think the beef started yet but i think it's important to note that Katy perry was starting to not peak out yet but she was starting to get that incline Katy perry was like a really big name now because didn't uh, i kiss the i yes. guess the girl came out with this one and, this uh, and hot and up cold in Vegas. i think uh, hot and cold is yeah actually i, I think, think hot and cold is after pretty, this one so Katy perry was was starting to become starting to become the biggest name in pop and um, as we're going to start to see, Taylor's going to start switching into pop. And I think that with the name of Katy Perry, it would be very intimidating to jump into that genre. Um, but, but for now, we're going to go into Speak Now, which came out in 2010. So let's speak now about it. I think that this might be her most forgettable album. I am not the biggest fan of this album, but I, I think that when I say that, I, I don't say it like as... Um, as like ignorant as I might come off. I know that's a very bold statement. I could acknowledge that her first two albums she was co-writing and this was her first solo written album. And while I think this song has one of her better songs um, being uh, Mean, I think that's one of her, her best country songs as well. I still find this album to, to fall a little flat and not leave as big of a impression. It doesn't have as many hits as, as far as I'm concerned that I, I really like just, you know, liked. I don't even like Never Grow Up. I don't I don't think that song's that, that, that good. I, th I, I The only song I like on this album is Mean. Yeah, I'm, I'm not even gonna fight you on this because our, <laughs> our views are probably very similar. It does show a Beatles-like progression in that you see where they're gonna be with the next step. Without this album, it would have been awkward to go from fearless to red and this did probably had to be there but we can still hate on it you know it's still not the best thing to come out in the history of mankind um you know but she does start to create her own sound because she ends up writing all the songs on her own on this time instead of like being a co-writer um she still has those pop love ballads uh she still has her tint of country rock but you know she's still moving forward into pop um i'd say while you personally don't like Never Grow Up, I think Never Grow Up is fine. Uh, and Mean mean is a bop. I mean, that is a big two middle fingers to the critics. And, and it comes in such a clean way, and I like it. Well, I was going to say, I think that it uh, aged well. Because, you know, she was saying all that, and then she actually did, you know, like, as, as we'll get into later. Um, I, I, I agree. This is, I, I feel like sometimes artists need to come a little short. Um, so that they can make the giants that they do that that Taylor will make. Um, but what what would you rate this album? I don't I don't think you said yet. Considering that Katy Perry's Teenage Dream came out and Katy Perry's uh, Teenage Dream had like five or six number one hits, and it looked like she was going to take on the world. And I know this shouldn't be a factor that directly influences how I rate this one. I still think it's important to when when you think about like what could have happened if Taylor failed on the next album after this. It's getting a low 4 out of 10. And it's not the lowest on my list, but it's close to the bottom. I I don't think I would give it that low of an album. Because, like, I think when you go below 5, you're saying it's kind of, like, a bad album. 
And I don't know if this is what you're saying, but that's just how I view it. So I would give this album just a five. I would think that this album is pretty average. Um, while some people who who may not understand where we're going with this, it, it, it's, it is important to mention Katy Perry dropping Teenage Dream just because that, that was, again, the biggest pop album at the time. It's going to be one of the greatest pop albums of all the time. And Katy Perry, like you said, was really setting herself up to be this really big name. Taylor Swift was trying to, she was dipping her toes into the pop, but I still would say this is more country um, than, than pop. I would say like a country pop. It would be, it, it's getting there. It would be, they call it cop. Cop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm ever going to call it that. That level's kind of cheesy. but Cheesy, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the save. Um, but, Honestly, uh, I, I think we, we, we kind of talk about this when we think about how beefs work nowadays because nowadays you just go on twitter and <laughs> or uh, you get go and go on instagram live and just you know say complain. i don't like you and then it's like oh my gosh that hurt my feelings but yeah back in the day back in the real beef so like the <laughs> 90s you know like i mean tupac and biggie they were they were shooting each other that was that was mm -hmm. no game but the most I, iconic beef i kind of wish the taylor and Katy perry and taylor and kanye kind of worked like that where, where taylor swift's just doing drive-by shoots <laughs> Jeez. Oh yeah, that's a, I, I, we completely forgot to mention that I think it was in 2008, 2009 at the VMAs. Um, that's when uh, a different beef, her first beef, she, she, I was going to say she didn't have a beef with Katy Perry yet still. I, I wouldn't say she didn't, I would say it would be around her, her uh, 2014 release when she would have her beef with Katy Perry. Right now she was, she was tackling uh, the giant uh, known as a uh, Kanye West. He's a giant. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, but I have to say, Beyonce made the greatest music video of all time. And then she's up there like, and then Bar Barack Obama's like, wow, that guy's a jerk. <laughs> as, 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 uh, as big of a Taylor fan as I am, um, I think I agree with Kanye. Yeah. I think uh, Single Ladies was definitely a better video. <laughs> <laughs> you belong to me just feels like it's, it's like trying to be like an 80s like movie like it's like it's a cliche we've seen before but all yeah. the single ladies that's beyonce at her best yeah well one of her best lemonade uh, everything about lemonade is amazing but. <laughs> <laughs> um i know i said it earlier than i think uh, taylor was more uh like i i like her more than beyonce but uh this is the the one of the few times i'll say beyonce definitely did it better but next, we're going to go into, as we were talking about beefs and, you know, drive-bys, this is where Taylor gets her gun and just creates a lot of red. Her next <laughs> album, Red, from 2012. Uh, red in 1989 are easily two of the greatest pop albums of all time. Uh, I've heard this being described as one of the best transitions in pop music history. Um, I was listening to Rolling Stone's Top 500 Greatest Albums uh, new podcast, and on this, on the episode where they're talking about Red, they're kind of talking about how, in a way, Red's kind of like Bob Dylan's bringing it all back home in the way that it's a mass transition into a, a new, more dynamic sound. Uh, for those of you who don't know, assuming a lot of our audience does it, one, go listen to Bringing it, Bring it All Back Home. It's a great album, but basically Bob Dylan, up to this point, was known for his folksy, acoustic, anti-establishment songs. But then here he makes this very electric, it's still a little bit anti-establishment, but it's also more fun, creative lyrics where he lets out his inner Shakespeare. And in a way, I think kind of that's what Taylor is doing because while Bob Dylan went electric, Taylor went synth pop and dubstep. Uh, and she still has that pump, pop, or pop country sound that she was known for in the past, but she really hides it up and makes like a very modern pop album. Uh, they also make a comparison to Exile on Main Street and how Exile uses blues riffs to, to progress, or blues riffs and like raw lyrics to go along with them to progress the album, and how T Swift uh, uses Masters 80s synth pop um, with her sound. You know, I think one of my favorite songs by her is 22. It's probably my favorite of her like hit hits. I know Cameron's not in his head. I think it's catchy. I can't wait to be 22 and play this. Like, it'll be 11 59, 59. I was shaking my head, not nodding my head. I disagree. Were you shaking it off? <laughs> too early. Yeah, too early. But I think Red is an amazing song. State of Grace is amazing. All too well. Stay, stay, stay. I knew you were trouble and we are never getting back together. All bops. Yeah. Um. I don't think that she went to 
dubstep. She it has a little bit of dubstep in there. Maybe it's like, like electronica, pop. not dubstep. I think it's electronica dubstep. I'm I'm, I'm standing with that. I would not I'm say standing. she was like Skrillex. Like when, it's not Skrillex. It's like a very like. I would, it was it was electronica. This is dubstep. Get out of it's here. It's like a minor dubstep. I know. I'm standing with it. It definitely. Yeah. If you listen to some of their songs, like I, I would not classify that as dubstep, but. Uh, Maybe debatable. maybe I'm just wrong. Yeah, I debate it. You know, it's debatable, but basically, it's it's techn technological, whatever yeah. you want to call it. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I wasn't the the I wasn't as aware to this album um, prior to me and Brandon talking about Taylor Swift. Um, I think that her next album, and when I started to get into her discography, her next album kind of uh, overshadowed this album I, I i often overlook this one just because of of how big the the next one was but when you when you were kind of talking about it and preaching about it i i went back and i listened to it and it's definitely a solid album i would definitely give it a 10 out of 10 it is it is a very good pop album i i really do enjoy it she i i think that um while she was starting to transition it's important to note that she still had some country on this album it wasn't entirely pop yet um but you can definitely see her maturing as a songwriter this is only her second solo writing album i, I believe um i don't think she had anyone work on it with her um i'd have to double check but uh, she she definitely was getting her footing and you could definitely see where she was she was heading and I think that this album was uh, kind of a, a um, w w What's the word I'm looking for it wasn't her peak it was kind of like We were wondering if she was going to be able to do it again. It was like a it was like a mountain that's flat at the top. I don't want to say it was like a one-hit wonder, but it was. It, we were like critics were wondering if it was going to be that one album, like that that outshined all of them, if she would be able to do it again, you know. And while we did say we weren't going to wet our pants over her relationships, it is. Hey, 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 don't don't look at me with that. Don't don't give me that look and that laugh because you know this is where start where it does become pot or beneficial to have some of uh, the references. Like, We Are Never Getting Back Together and Red are probably associated with Jake John Hall, one of the best actors of the t 2000s with uh, Nightcrawler, uh, Brokeback Mountain. Uh, and he, he, he's just a great actor, but basically they dated and those two are about him. I Knew Your Trouble was about Harry Styles and whether or not you like Harry Styles or not, he is one of the best male artists of the past five years. Obviously with One Direction, he was the star. Uh, not saying One Direction is the greatest thing since... Uh, sliced bread but it is what it is uh, and yeah because like the prior love songs like Back to December from uh, Speak Now okay that's about Taylor Lautner whatever but this is where we start like, whoa I feel it Mr. Krabs <laughs> <laughs> I do not agree that Harry Styles is the male solo artist of the last five years I do not agree with that he's top five I, I don't maybe agree. maybe Bruno Mars in the weekend might have him I do not like Harry Styles uh, that is to uh, each their own to each their own but it's fine because we're actually about to go and transform into a different time 1999 oh sorry Ni we're not prince 1989 <laughs> um this is also probably one of the greatest pop albums of all time i think i like it personally better than red um and it kind of transitions well like the beatles transition from rubber soul to revolver or stevie wonder's transition from talking book to interversions it's okay, these guys aren't playing around. They're here to stay. They're here with the new sound, and people are going to dig it up. Um, it, it, and uh, it does bop harder, and it has amazing songs. It's my personal favorite, Wildest Dreams, Welcome to New York, which kind of is a symbolization of I'm, I'm gone, Nashville. I'm gone, countryside. Well, not gone, but I'm kind of I'm making a more urban vibe to my music. Uh, blank Space, Shake It Off, Bad Blood, How You Get the Girl and Clean, or just mwah, a chef's kiss. However, I'm, I'm going to be honest, while I know it is one of my favorites, I did have beef with this album for a little bit just because, you know, all the Visco girls were jamming to it when they were younger and played them in every store at every shopping mall in America, and it got old. But now that it's not old anymore, it's new. 
This, in my opinion, is the greatest pop album of all time. I absolutely adore this album. This album made me a Taylor Swift fan. Uh, I think it, like you said, this is uh, the album that kind of established Taylor Swift as the, the artist of our, our generation, or was at least leading up to that. I think that uh, a couple other things that she had done, like like she stayed relevant um, after this album, but this was the album that, that really said that she was here to stay, like you said. Um, it's important to note that this was when she she moved from Nashville to New York, and that's why you have Welcome to New York. You can see that transition where she she really kind of blossoms from her her country roots and, and turns into this pop star. She um, th this album really doesn't have any bad song except for um, Out of the Woods. Yeah, I'm not yeah, I'm not the biggest fan. Song. I, it, it, I wouldn't say it's awful, it's just too repetitive for me. But it's um, fine, it's, it's album is still 10 out of 10, it does it I was going to say, it should say how big of a deal the rest of the album is if I'd still give it a 10 out of 10 and still like, you know, not like that song as much as I do. This album has stayed, re I think this album's probably stayed the most relevant out of all of her songs. I feel like Shake It Off is the smells like teen spirit of the 2010s i know that uh i bring that song up i reference that song a lot but for those of you who do not know smells like teen spirit i say um was the song in the 90s like it was constantly played people were getting sick and tired of it just because it was it was on mtv all the time i think shake it off is the smells like teen spirit of the uh, uh 2010s I, I was when when I first got into this album I I was kind of surprised to see like how many like of her big songs were on here like Bad Blood Shake It Off Blank Space all of those were on there and I was I was like you know like it, it, it's no wonder why people constantly refer to this album as one of the greatest it's it's pretty fun to like look at her inspiration from like 80s synth pop synth pop and uh, utilizing that and then um, really. Um, honing in on her skills as a uh, as a songwriter and kind of maturing as a songwriter as well you see a little bit less um talking about you know individual breakups and more about her battles with you know critics her battles as a as an as an artist someone that's always in the spotlight the media is always attacking her and i know it might sound cheesy or whatever but you know shake it off is a is a pretty good like middle finger i think to the uh the media kind of like i don't care what you're saying you know and i really like the instrumental in that one like the the baritone saxophone in that album or in that song is is like very killer i i have to agree <laughs> yeah she's definitely more empowered in this album than she probably ever ever has uh, been before and it, it does become a thing in my mind where it's just like i don't want to necessarily say this is the greatest pop album of all time or of uh the 2010s because i don't know i because when i'm back in my mind i'm also thinking of adele's 21 i'm thinking of beyonce's lemonade um thinking of cranes in the sky so many i don't know maybe not cranes in the sky we'll definitely say 21 and lemonade i'd say the, the debate is between uh those two and then red and 1989 so there's four that easily debatable but i can definitely i'm definitely not ashamed to say that it probably is i probably put 1989 over them but who knows it's <laughs> it, it, it fluctuates in my mind a lot fluctuates that's 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 the that's the curse of being you know a music lover you know you always change always you change, change with the time but um i think uh this is this is also where you you start to see her beef with Katy Perry. I think that she kind of shoved Katy Perry off of the mountain that she was on. Um, I don't. What what was the album that came out? Katy Perry released an album in twenty fourteen. Was it Prism? Uh, but it had it had Roar on it and Prism. it had Dark Horse on it. I think. I think it's Prism. Yeah. I sure hope it is because I've said it confidently three times. It I'm pretty fell, sure it is. It fell pretty flat, and I think that a big part of that was due to nineteen eighty nine success. I think that um, it, it th this is where the beef started, you know, with this album. Sorry, were you going to say something? Oh, I was just going to say gunshots fired. Yeah, <laughs> gunshots fired. I think they were fighting over some, like, dancers or whatever. Yeah, because I think Katie was trying to recruit some of Taylor's, like, backup dancers because there's no backup dancers in the world, I guess. They're, she couldn't have just picked, like, a few of her own. She had to pick one. But she already worked. Well, I think I the thing was, was that, she, yeah, worked, worked. she worked with them. But, you know, when Taylor's doing – Arguably one of the biggest selling like concerts of all time with 1989, you know, 
I probably wouldn't have given up that spot either for Prism. No way. No way. <laughs> However, even though I will say, watching her live in concert during this time is not it's not something I ideally like to do. I like the album. I don't, I'm not necessarily a big fan of how she presented herself at the time because, you know, she kind of strays away from the girl next door image and just, it's not saying that she becomes as evil as the next album we're going to be talking about, but it's just a, a little bit uncomfortable. Um, I don't know, because I kind of like her like NPR tiny music vibe. I think if she would have done that maybe on a lower scale would have been cool, but obviously when you're the biggest star in the world, you have to go big or beyond, so I understand. Yeah. But. Um. I, I were mistaken. Prism actually came out in 2013. Um, I think that it kind of fell a little flat, and then this album just kind of swept it under the rug, in my opinion. But yeah, to, to go off what you were saying, this is I, the, the thing that makes this album, I think, a little bit more personable is because Taylor Swift starts to present herself still. You, she, she's always presented herself as this. She didn't just start to do this as that girl next door, as that, as that you know, somebody that's very relatable. And, um, and I think that. Even though she, she she's still pretty young, she's like 25, 24, um, she's still pretty young with this album, and I think that later on she starts to, 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 to grow up, and, and, and when, when she's re reinventing herself, she does it a little bit too maturely. I think that her whole image was just being, again, the girl next door, just someone that's very relatable. And this album comes a little bit more. I, I I like the even the album cover, like just like the the um Polaroid. Yeah, the Polaroid. I think that it's just a very bare bones, but um like you know like just not trying very hard to impress. And it gives that sense of nostalgia. Yeah, that she's exactly. Already been having the exactly. past year too, but unfortunately, she she loses us with the next album, which. Cameron and I will probably agree is her worst one, if not on the closer to the bottom. Uh, but on that note, we're going to take a quick little break before we go in and discuss that album. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Uh, so now we're going to go on to that album that we know it's pretty awful. It's cringy. And honestly, I hope this doesn't ruin our reputation by saying that. But um, the next album's reputation. So I think this is her cringiest and worst album to date. She starts off with this trap style of music that you know you think you'd hear at strip clubs, and uh, you know that's how it is for the four, first four songs. But then after that, it just calms down like way too much and just ruins the whatever vibe she was going for. And it starts sounding like 1989 and Red again, but it's still like an awkward gateway between losing that girl next door status, where it's just kind of cute and playable to wow, this is this is aggressive. This is aggressive. I do like Gateway Car, Delicate, and Came My Heart, but that's kind of it. I think the rest of it is just like, ah, it just makes my body inch. Yeah, look, What You Made Me Do is by far my least favorite Taylor Swift song. It Taylor Swift kind of has um, some songs that are just overtly repetitive, and that's why I don't like um, um, Are We Out of the Woods. Uh, even Welcome to New York is pretty repetitive, uh, but... Look what you made me do is just it, it 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 tries too hard and that's how I describe this album. It's definitely my least favorite of her pop albums and probably my least favorite Taylor Swift album entirely. I really don't like how uh, dark and aggressive she is with this. And you gotta kind of give her some credit because again we we keep talking about how Taylor Swift kind of changes with the times and I feel like 2017 and 2018 there was I mean it was very trap based. It was very dark and very heavy. Um, like very much more aggressive. I think there was a lot at least in the pop scene. I think it was and um, You start to see that transition into anti-pop later on But again, we we got to this very aggressive stage of it and she tries to keep up with it but it, it, it's really not who she is and I um, I know that sounds a little cheesy, but uh, it just doesn't work with her in this album um, because I feel like she's still trying to talk about those topics that she 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 goes on about with uh you know like we see in 1989 in red she talks about like those like um, standing up against other people and and doing all this and that but it's just in a way that it's just like it it's very distracting and kind of harsh to listen to at times I think um, I definitely think this is one of her most forgettable acts uh especially like in her pop scene yeah that's um 
It's like the Rolling Stones trying to be super 80s when they're not, you know? Yeah. Rolling Stones are this, like, raw, like, classic rock band, and then when they try to do their 80s stuff, it's just, it's just like, where's the shotgun? Yeah. Um, I think Endgame is also a pretty awful track as well. I, I, I think it's very weak. Um, it has Ed Sheeran and Future, which I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm here for those weird collabs, but this is... I don't really like Ed Sheeran to begin with. Um, I don't like Future. Or, I don't, yeah, I'm not a big Future fan either. Yeah. I don't know. I think if she didn't have the first four songs on this album... It'd uh, be a little bit better? It'd be a little better. It's, it's just one of those cases. It's like the Tupac effect. Just having too much music takes away from what the good stuff. You know, that's fair. Um, but, I mean, like, at the time, too, I think that you kind of have to... Uh, acknowledge where where she was going um taylor swift kind of was doing a lot outside of the music scene i think um while still being in the music scene um she was kind of protesting against uh, apple music because it was a streaming and uh streaming service and for those who don't know streaming services are kind of brutal on artists they don't really pay artists too much just because uh they're not like people aren't necessarily buying their music they're just streaming it and the artist doesn't get paid um, a lot, especially like up and coming artists. And Taylor Swift had this very long letter written out to Apple Music, um, kind of just telling them why she didn't want to work with them. She felt like it was a scandal. And I think that that's a very big statement, especially for someone who, you know, has, has a really big name and doesn't really need to worry about like finances. Um, like the it, she can stream and she's going to get a bunch of hits, you know. But she did it just because uh, she, you know, she was fighting for uh, those those uh, uh, up and coming artists. Like I said, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, well, I I think that's where I started having a little bit of respect for her too. Because I mean, this this chick has a home in in uh, Rhode Island on Newport, yeah, Newport Beach, Rhode Island, and and that's like that's Richville. I mean, the Vanderbilts and those Rockefeller families built their like lavish estates. Like some of the, really? some of the most lavish estates in the United States are on, uh, are basically in Newport, Rhode Island. I didn't and, know that. Yeah. She has, she has a house there. So yeah, she's never, she's going to be fine. And she has a little apartment in New York city. She's chilling, but you know, she was sticking up for the younger man or the, the helpless <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah. Um, she and, still happened to make a four out of ten album with reputation, though. But at yeah. least she was doing a lot of good outside of it. That's that's kind of what I'm trying to draw attention from. I, you know, like like I said, big Taylor Swift fan. I I don't want people to you know like be to harp on on this album too much because like because even though that this album did come out and I'm not a fan of it, she was still doing a lot like outside, especially also with the the Me Too movement. I think that was a little before though. I think that was like 2016, 2015, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Um, she had become a really big pillar for that movement, um, just because she had joined it with, uh, there was a, a former radio host, or I don't know who it was, um, off the top of my head, I just know they were a radio host, I don't even know if it was stated, but, uh, they had, uh, you know, done all that stuff to her, and she, she actually filed a lawsuit and won against them, and she only sued the, the dude for one dollar, which, is when I personally became like a, a, a Taylor Swift fan when I found that out and started to learn about it. Sorry. Was that, does that have any correlation to the Lady uh, Gaga incident as well? Or was that happening around the same time? Or was she helping? Probably. Was she she helped, no, no, she helped Kesha. She or funded, Kesha, not yeah. Lady Gaga. Sorry. No, she funded Kesha's. Uh, that was another big pop name I forgot to mention back in the early 10. Sorry I confused Kesha with Lady Gaga. I should just go and shut off the <laughs> Um, But, uh, yeah, again, um, doing did, great things. Yeah, and and she she did also help fund uh, Kesha's fight against her. I don't know, like well, manager or whoever it yeah, was. Yeah, because I think that was me too. Like that was one of the another huge things that happened at the beginning. Yeah, me too. And I don't want to sound too like cheesy or anything with it. Um, like I'm not going to say anything about the Me Too movement, but Taylor Swift definitely played a big part in it, and I think that she's one of those few cases, at least in my eyes. Not trying to discredit any anyone or anything, but she really made it apparent she wasn't doing it for like the attention or the money. She was just doing it as a statement to like show that she was again empowered and and didn't need to you know like she kind of just shook him off. <laughs> you know? She shaked she sh she shaked it off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll agree. I'll agree. She's definitely one of the driving forces be behind a lot of um, the movements going on right now. And you know what? Mass respect to her for it. And you know what? Her being such a a big. Uh, vocal point for a lot of the people who didn't get uh 
a voice, I think it's only fitting that she kind of fell a little bit more back on her on her you know roots in the in the pop system with her her next album uh lover that came out in 2019 i think this is a little bit her her biggest uh flamboyant album she was very uh she was very uh like outspoken with this album and was was not just fighting for like women but also the lgbt um community community yeah um i know her one album or her one music video i can't think of it um i cannot think of it which which one was it? I don't think it was, I don't think it was the lover one. I, one of the music videos from this was was, was very uh, empowering to to that community, and I think that it was only fitting because you know that was becoming a very big thing as well. I think this is our hidden gem. Um, I love this album. <laughs> um, you are a lover of this album. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it sounds like a blend of nineteen eighty nine and Red, which is again more. If I had to listen to pop Taylor Swift, this is definitely what I want. Uh, amazing songs such as Cool Summer, Lover, The Archer, I Think He Knows, Paper Ring, Soon You'll Feel Better, and Afterglow. Again, another chef's kiss. Um, not saying that she should stick with this sound forever, but again, it is one of, if I want to listen to pop Taylor, it's one of my more preferred. Yeah, I, I definitely um, I agree with you. I think this is, uh, I don't want to say that she's fallen off. Um, at all but I think that the sound of the late 2010s didn't really match up with this and I think that reputation I don't I don't know the overall opinion of the album but in it, at least how I look at it I think that she kind of noticed that wasn't her sound with reputation and she kind of went back to her old sound but her old sound wasn't really like the sound of the modern radio if that makes any sense um, so this album is often overlooked just because I think that it it did have that that older 2010 like the early 2010 pop sound. So while it wasn't necessarily in, I don't think it's a bad album at all. I think it's it, again, I think it's a, one of her hidden gems and um I definitely like this album a little bit more than than people might think or like would like if if you haven't listened to this album and think that it's just another like kind of like bad one like I, just because you haven't heard about it or like it's hits aren't like on the radio as much i would uh i would definitely check it out eight out of ten for me eight out of ten i i i would give it a seven and a half okay yeah <laughs> he goes half a half a decimal or whatever <laughs> all right but now we have to go to her best album and i know cameron doesn't agree with me but folklore is taylor or t swift's best album um, it, it's a revamp into this new form, and I honestly want this album to be her immediate future. Uh, she gives us a very calm, minimalist, indie folk album that evokes a lot of beautiful and different emotions. I don't think there's a bad track on this album. Uh, maybe I could take her leave Exile and August, but you know what? Songs such as The Last Great American Dynasty, The One, Cardigan, Betty, and Seven are all gems. To me, this is it's kind of a mix of Joni Mitchell's Blue, Carol King's Tapestry, and Lucinda Williams' Car Wheels on a Gravel Road, and it's just so calm and peaceful and says what it needs to say. I don't hate this album. I think it's a very good album, but uh, again, as I as I've been constantly reminding everyone, she is constantly trying to reinvent herself, and with this album, she does a much better job of. Of doing a little bit more of like the the kind of modern sound of like the minimalist um, a little bit more dark but like a, like not overtly dark uh, like I said I, I think I keep going anti-pop but this isn't an anti-pop album this is just kind of like a little bit more up to date Taylor Swift and I think that it does a better job uh, than lover did just because it, it sounds a little bit more like those those artists that are really big right now but in my opinion i listened to this album um so when this album first came out you know listened was absolutely blown away by it, it was like wow this is this is really good then the second time i listened to it, it it was right around the august um point i don't remember what's the next day after august i think it's uh the uh my my tears ricochet or, or something like that um i can check it real quick uh. they both kind of sounded 
too much like Lana Del Rey to me. Um, and I'm not saying that she's stealing from her. I kind of do just to toy with Brandon and to make him mad. Um, but it, it sounds a little too much like, um, something else. It doesn't really sound as much like it sounds a little less like inspired and more a little like, uh, plagiarized in my opinion, not crazily, not like, not like too, too bad, but it's less impressive in my opinion. I feel like she was less like inspired. I, I, I don't know. I, I didn't feel like she was as, uh, um, uh, original with this one. And, uh, I still think it's a really good album. I would give it a, a solid eight, maybe even a nine out of 10, but it, it, it's, it's not as, you know, revolutionary Taylor Swift as Brandon thinks. At least in my opinion. I don't think it sounds like Lana Del Rey. And even if it did, are you saying Lana Del Rey is... I feel like you're giving no, a negative... I, you're, no, 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 I like Lana Del Rey. You're giving a negative connotation to Lana Del Rey is what you're doing. No, no, you no. You must have I'm not just... listened to Born to Die, Lust for Life, and Norman Bleeping Rockwell. No, I, I, I really like Lana Del Rey. But and Taylor's that's not what I'm her. I, okay. Well, <laughs> well, there's definitely some inspiration. There's got to be. I was literally Maybe just inspiration, but... Mm. But the, it's just too much for me. She was too inspired. She wasn't too inspired. She she had to make it her own. There was just too many times, and I know that I'm not the only person that, that thinks this way. I'm sure there's someone else out there that, that definitely listens to this and is like, yeah, that sounds like they're Lana Del Rey. No, they're not. They're, they're, there's no way. Um, you can say what you want. I, I, don't, I don't, like, bash you for thinking this is your best album, but... I, you know, Taylor Swift has a lot of time, has had a lot of time. She's had eight albums, if you include this one, to really, you know, work on her, her skills as an artist. And early on in her career, it was very, like, very, um, like, surprising that she did that big jump into pop. But now, I think it's kind of her image to do that. And I like to, to make the shifts. I think so. I think it's her, her, her way of reinventing herself and making sure that she stays, you know, up with the, uh, you know, like just so she doesn't sound one noted or anything. And I think she does a really good job doing that. But because she's done it so many times, you know, like we've said, you look at 1989 transition from from. So listen to this. You transition from her country stage to her early pop stage with Red in 1989. Then you transition to it like her her darker pop with Reputation, and then back to Lover. You see, she she constantly fluctuates and is constantly like just mixing it up. And because she does it so much, because that's starting to become a part of her as like an artist, you're a little bit more critical when she doesn't. And I think that with this album, it was it was very surprising. She didn't she didn't advertise this or anything. She just dropped it, and I think that was very very important to its success. Was people just was like, they they were like, what is this? Like, let's listen to it, and that's why everybody went to it. But uh, sorry, especially during a pandemic time. Oh, especially yeah. yeah. We're just like we were like, well, what's going on? Like, what what is life like? What, <laughs> like just so what much crazy, life? just so much craziness going on, and then she re drops this, and then it's. A peaceful melodic album you're just like wow this really takes away from all, <laughs> all the lovely stuff going on in our world and um i'm not trying to discredit this album at all like i i know i'm being very critical of it but i do like this album i would like i said i i rated an eight or an nine out of ten i just think that because she's maturing as an artist because she's she's you know been around for so long we need to see her you know doing something that's that's a little bit a little further ahead of the curve like I want to say like she's she was ahead of the curve but really I want her to be like another step from the curve like I want her to to set the trend not follow the trend and make it cooler I guess to each their own <laughs> different strokes for different folk <laughs> but I think so one of the last things Cameron and I are gonna do is we're actually we actually made a list of, if we had to rank it from eight to one because she has eight albums of what we would say if we if we had a preference of listening number eight i have reputation um i, I don't know which one you have on uh, your list no i also have reputation i think that um with this album it was just too much i think too that much. she tried too much um i think that she does a better job when she doesn't give a lot 
uh, especially with her her um, pops phases. Uh, but I think that that kind of leads into my number seven pick for her. I think that my number seven pick is going to be Fearless, uh, just because. In a way, I think that she she didn't switch it up too 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 much from her her first album, Taylor Swift. And I know you you probably don't agree with me on number seven. Yeah, I have Fearless much higher. I actually have Speak Now um, as my number seven. Just a little bit of <clears throat> not her, her strongest album, but a good stepping stone. Uh, but I do have Taylor Swift uh, her self titled debut coming after that number six. I think it's good. I think it's good, but not as well, I, I think it's generic, but it's not bad. Um, so that's why it's my number six. Um, I am going to agree with you on that. I think that her her country phase, uh, I would I would include Speak Now in her country phase. Those three albums were definitely her trying to get her footing as an artist. And while I think that Taylor Swift is a better country album than Fearless, I think that Speak Now is a better country album. Um, I know it. I know I said that it was a little bit forgettable, but uh, you also kind of have to look at like where she was coming from with that album. As uh, even though I didn't rate it out of ten as uh, high as I did with Taylor Swift, um, I think that I put Speak Now as I think I said five out of ten. I think I put Fearless and Taylor Swift both as six. Um, I think Speak Now was a bigger stepping stone for her as an artist. And is way more important, and you start to see her really um, get her footing, and and really start to, to push out those really good albums that we'll see later on. Uh, my number five is uh, Loveless or Loveless Lover, <laughs> <laughs> the Loveless. opposite of Loveless. Uh, I, my number five is Love Lover. I think um, it has a lot of elements that make some of her other albums great. Uh, and then my number four is actually Fearless uh, because Fearless I think has some of the best of her country. Uh, country rock, country pop, whatever. Country rock, pop, or cough, pop. Cop. <laughs> or cop, cop, pop. Cop, pop. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, you, I know you don't have that as your number four. No, number four for me is Lover. I think that, uh, like we said before, this is her hidden gem. That uh, this was, I don't know if it was a softer release. I, I don't think that I was I was too into Taylor Swift when this album came out. So I wouldn't, I don't, I couldn't say if this was her soft, softest release. But um, I think that uh, it's a it's a very good pop album, and it may be the last pop album like that that version of her that we get for a long time at least, if ever, um, because I know she's starting to transition into her her folklore, which I have as number three, um, and I uh, like I said, this is definitely one of her best albums, but. I like Taylor Swift better as a pop artist than like this indie artist. Um, I don't want to say like that as like a, a permanent statement. I, I want to see her try other stuff, um, but right now I think that she isn't. Even though she's tackling this new genre of like that indie rock, I think that um, she needs to do a little bit more better of a job of making it her own and adding her own little Taylor Swift spice to it. My third is probably gonna get a red, red, great pop album. Um, it's it's definitely a great transition into the next part of her um, career. Uh, and then my number two is 1989 because it does the same, but it revolutionizes it a little more and kind of makes it catchier and poppier. Um, I know you probably don't have that as your number two. I actually have Red as number two. Uh, I think that it was kind of obvious to see where my list was going after Folklore. Um, yeah, Red definitely is 10 out of 10. She has she has a, a few really, like, like I think that her, the, the top three are are pretty set in stone. I think anybody is going to agree that, that 1989, Red, and Folklore are her top three. And, um some of the, the the best albums that have come out in the last 10 years and there's there's no denying that red does a really good job of her finally letting go of her country roots um i think of it as more of like a send-off to her her early career and more of like a introduction to um her later career like i said you see the roots of the country in it um but you also this is where she she starts to show off her skills as a pop artist and then in my number one pick she not only shows it off but she blows it out of the water uh 1989 easily my number one pop pick 
or my number one Taylor Swift pick and my number one pop pick. Um, <laughs> she uh, she definitely is. Uh, you know, I think this is going to be the album that our grandkids are going to know Taylor Swift by when they get into it. At least for now, they're I'm not saying she can't put anything else out. I don't. I. I kind of want to, though. I feel like Taylor Swift does the best when nobody's expecting anything from her, if that makes any sense. But uh, with that being said, I think uh, 1989's easily her best album. As I said, Folklore is easily my favorite album of her. I love this new transition into any folk. I, I hope it stays for at least two or three albums. Uh, then we'll see how we're feeling about her and where, where we want her to go. But for now, that's definitely what I want. You know, I can't wait to see her at like Bonnaroo or Coachella. Or... I think that... Uh... It's kind of uh, just a. Uh, I, I think you're not a Taylor Swift fan, if I'm being honest. I think that you are just a folklore fan. I think that you don't understand what Taylor Swift stands for, if I'm being honest here. Really? Because I, I, I think I was praising 1989 Red Folklore. You can praise it, but I don't think that. I think your actions speak louder than your words, and the way that you're you're showing your your listing is is saying that I don't think you appreciate it as much as you you state you do. You know what? Next time Taylor Swift's in town, I'll be getting <laughs> tickets. I uh, thought you said I thought you said that um, um, you liked Red more than 1989. No, I didn't. I never said uh, that. You definitely said that. No, I didn't. You said that you you could you could like it more than 1989. I said I could. I I, I put myself in a lot of hypothetical. <laughs> situations when i talk about media and art so here's a big middle finger to you but we're not going to be giving any middle fingers to taylor swift because we wish her the best of luck in her career i think she has a lot more to offer and if she doesn't have anything else to offer she's already offered us so much so with that final message uh we hope we want to thank you guys for listening and the continued support and we hope you all have a great rest of your day